All right, so we're starting a new series called Start With Yes. Yeah? Woo! Yeah! Stepping into yes is what we're going to talk about tonight. Stepping into yes. So we're stepping in to yes. Start with yes. So this is, this is a series about boldness. Now, what's crazy is last summer, uh, the staff and I, part of the staff, uh, we were all up in, or we were down at Canyon Lake, and we were praying, and we were seeking the face of God, and we were like, what is kind of the direction for this year? And we got two words. One was boldness, and one was power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, when I asked Nathan Teeters if he would come and speak, um, he's like, you know what, I just feel led to talk from Acts, and to talk about boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? That's crazy. That's exactly where we're heading in this next series. And uh, so we're actually going to be hanging out in Acts because that is the birth of the church. That's the birth of, of what we are a part of, the church age that started in Acts 2, and it's going to go through Revelation, where I believe the rapture or the second coming, whichever comes first, happens. And that will be the end of the church age, and we'll be going into a whole different epoch or different age, uh, which will be where God is reigning from his kingdom in the physical way. But right now we are in the church age, and it started in the book of Acts. And if you want to know more about the book of Acts, we did a whole series a couple years ago called Relentless. If you want to go check out Mikey Little on YouTube, or you can go to our website and go to sermons. You can go back anyway. It'll take you right there uh, to look at the Relentless series. And we talked about uh, how they were relentless they had a relentless pursuit of God and a relentless pursuit of the people that he loves. But we're going to be taking a bit of a different direction. We're going to be taking apart three, we're going to take apart four stories in this four-part series before Thanksgiving. And I hope you come ready to receive. I hope you come like sponges, ready to write your notes and, 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 and seek the face of God in this. As we look at the very first Christians, what they were known for was boldness. What they were known for was boldness. And, and so power of the Holy Spirit meets them in their place of boldness. They would step out in boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit would fill it. Either that or boldness was the evidence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Because Peter, this very guy who was hiding a few days before, after Acts 2, you know, when Jesus was being crucified and he was hiding, a few days later when they're, they're up in an upper room uh, just, and the Holy Spirit drops and they get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, he gets up and preaches this bold message from the rooftops. The same guy that was hiding is now preaching from the rooftops and 3,000 people get saved. And now they got an issue because if 3,000 people got saved right now, every one of us would have to be discipling like hundreds of people. You know what I'm saying? Like we would all have to be on our game. So they had to have the boldness to understand what was going on. And, and this made it for a legit logistical nightmare because all of the uh, apostles had to get together and figure out, okay, how are we going to lead this big monolith of thing, you know, that's called the church? Boldness became the evidence that the Holy Spirit was inside of you. It was almost like the cowardice lion of, that Peter was became a bold and raging lion after the Holy Spirit came into his life. And so my question for you to this, is this, should we not also have boldness? Amen. In any case, boldness and power of the Holy Spirit are linked. They, where, where the Holy Spirit is, there will be boldness. Where there is boldness, there will be power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be unpacking all of that here in the next few weeks. Saying yes. So if we start with yes, that's where I'm talking about. Just say yes. Start with yes. By, by saying yes, yes is putting a lot of confidence in the person you're saying yes to, right? It's like giving God a blank check. You just say, yes, God, and you give him a blank check, and you say, whatever you don't want it, whatever you want to do, whenever, however, why ever, God, I give you the right to mess with my life. It's putting confidence in God. If you say, God, I trust you, you're putting confidence in him. Hebrews 13, 6 says this, so we say with confidence, someone say confidence, the Lord is my helper. We, who, we just prayed about this. Who is your helper? Do you run to the, the phone before you run to the throne? Who's the, when you run into a problem, who's the first person you go to? Now, at first, it's not usually God. When you first get saved, it's usually you run to your mom, you run to your boyfriend, your girlfriend. But, but we need to start slowly shifting that. Now, we, where does our help come from? Where does our true source come from? It has to come from God. The Lord, we say with confidence, the Lord's my helper. He's the one who's going to help me. I will not be afraid. Why we don't say yes to things when God tells us to step out is because we're afraid. What can mere mortals, what can man do to me? This is speaking about the fear of man. 
people pleasing. What will happen if I say this? This person might not show up anymore. What will happen if I say no to them? They won't invite me anymore. What, we're so afraid of what people think about us. And we say, I don't care what people think, but you actually do. Let's say this again. Let's say it together. So we say with confidence, come on church, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Yes is bold. That is actually the definition of bold, is saying yes is bold, it's confidence. Boldness, uh, the Greek word there, in uh, one of the Greek words in the New Testament for bold is confidence. Good courage. Courage and boldness are, 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 are simultaneously the same thing. So exercise courage. An antonym, uh, the opposite of boldness is this other word, um, a, poxi- a popsicle? A popsicle? Is anybody in here a popsicle? I'm a popsicle? I'm not a popsicle. Are you a popsicle? To breathe out one's life, faint, feeble, to be weary. You might hear tired. To constrain oneself, that would mean self-conscious. To shudder, to show cowardice. But another one, this other word, to dare to speak outright. This is boldness. To dare to speak outright without reserve, without restraint, to dare. Someone say to dare. To dare. This is what the church was known for. They were daring. They threw themselves out there. They said, Red Rover, Red Rover, let the devil come on over. And they said, you know what? You can do whatever you want to our body. You can't kill our soul. You can do whatever you want to. And they watched God cast out demons and heal the sick guy at Gate Beautiful in chapter 3. And they, they saw persecution break out. They saw Paul get stoned and then get back up at the end and go right back into the same city he just got stoned in and prayed over other people, casting out demons and healing the sick. This was to dare. This is the birthright of the church. Amen? Amen. Don't be a popsicle. Someone say, don't be a popsicle. popsicle. (laughs) Another word is to dare. In Acts 16, we come to this this one. So I'm going to kind of go to the end or the middle of the book. And we're going to go backwards and then come back forward in the next three. In Acts 16, this is after Paul has already been on the road uh, with his friend Silas. They come to a town called Lystra. Chapter 16, verse 1. And in this town where a disciple named Timothy lived. Someone say Timothy. Timothy. Whose mother was a Jewish and, her, and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. So she was a Jewish person that then began to believe in Jesus and so she's a believer. The, the dad was a Greek. It doesn't say if he's a believer or not. He might have been. He might not have. The believers at Lystra and Iconium, the, the near town, spoke highly of Timothy. They said, this guy is a good, he's a good kid. He's probably in his 19, 20, 21, 22, right around that same freaking age that you guys are. Young man. Believers spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along the journey. So he circumcised him because the Jews who lived in that area, they're not even going to listen to a guy unless he's circumcised. So, so it wasn't to be saved that Timothy did this, but Timothy allowed it to happen so that he could be a witness towards these people that were hard-hearted, which was the Jewish people. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. And so that was basically like his admittance, his, his ticket to get in the door just to speak to them. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem in chapter 15, where they said, hey, I guess the Gentiles are, can be saved now too. Cool. So go tell everybody and let them in. And so they started going around telling them that same story. You can read that in chapter 15, but back in 16, verse 5, and this is what happened. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they grew in their numbers. Whenever everything was aligned correctly, when they did what they were supposed to do, The church was strengthened in their faith, and they grew in numbers. So let's look at this for a moment. Paul barely knows this kid. And on the reference of the people of the town who are believers, he puts himself out there. He knows what he's up against. He's been to towns where they beat him up, where they stoned him, where they did all kinds of horrible things to him. Here's this kid. He's an upstart. He's a new kid. He's faithful. He's strong. He's he's hardcore in the Lord. But Paul doesn't know much about him other than that. The Holy Spirit says, take this kid with you on your journey. Take him under your wing. Mentor him. Disciple him. Take him with you. Let him see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Show him what it means to be a pastor. 
So he dares, and he's like, okay, I'm going to take this kid under my wing. Another kid had just quit on him. John Mark had quit on him. He, he quit early, early, uh, earlier in a couple of chapters ago, and he's like, forget this. I ain't doing this, but then God's like, I want you to take another one. Try again. Someone say, try again, because sometimes we got burned one time, and we think that that's where it ended, and we don't need to try again. Someone say, try again. again. Put his heart back out there again, so he dares, and he takes this kid under his wing. Timothy, on the other hand, doesn't know this guy very well. Paul, he's, a, he's kind of a hero of the faith, but, but he barely knows this guy. He doesn't know if their personalities will click, if there's going to be good chemistry, with disciple and discipler, mentor and apprentice. He doesn't know, but God tells him, go with Paul. At least we read that in the text in between the lines that, that he says, I wanted to take him on. And he said, what? Yes. God says, take this kid. What does Paul say? Yes. Timothy, God says to Timothy, go with Paul. What does Timothy say? And Timothy gives up everything, his family business, all the things he was doing, all the plans he had. He changed his major, went into the pastoral track, and went with Paul on a place to become a pastor, into a place that never heard the gospel before. Amen? It's crazy. Stepping into boldness, that's confidence. Stepping into boldness. Someone say, step in. Step in. That's stepping into Yes is stepping out boldly into the confidence of what God has called you to do. And that is going to be what we're going to talk about this whole series. My number one strength, anybody do Strength Finder? Did they make you do the Strength Finder? Yeah. Are there any activators out there? Raise your hand if you're an activator. If you got an activator in your first, in your top five. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Friends. Yes. Friends. Yes. Um, activators like to start things. It's like we are putting on our seat, we're, we're driving before we put on our seatbelt, right? We're backing out and putting on our seatbelt at the same time. We want to get things going. We say, yes, we just get it going. We'll start today. Why wait till tomorrow? Let's go today. We start driving and we don't even know where we're going. And then we pull up our maps and we get going because we don't want to waste time. We want to start things, right? Someone say, start it. Start, it. start the dang car. Yes. Um, that's my number one strength. Some people would say that is a a weakness, but Strength Finder would call that a strength. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm the only one who believes it. Uh, I want to show you a picture of my boy Eli. Go ahead. This is crazy. <laughs> this, is my, this is Eli. Um, and the crazy story about this is this is right after his knee was healed. Uh, I talked about this a couple of uh, weeks ago, several weeks ago. Um, it was so bad he was going to have to go into surgery. Uh, leadership team prayed over him, and uh, a family friend of ours prayed over him. And the next day he was up and running around and doing cartwheels again like, like we didn't think it was, it was possible. But he is crazy, and this is his normal natural state. Just look at that face. He's just, this is his normal. Um, my, uh, my parents uh, said that I'm a lot like Jesus because uh, you never know when I'm going to come back home and um, when I'm going to return. And uh, they say that Eli is a lot like God because he's omnipresent. He's just everywhere. He's just bouncing off the walls, and he is literally, I call him an electron. He's just everywhere. That's my, that's my son, and he's crazy. Someone say, he's crazy. he's crazy. Let me show you a picture of my dad. This is my dad. Uh, <laughs> We just got an American Ninja Warrior slack line with all these kind of crazy things. And, and me and uh, AJ drove by there uh, the other day when I was preaching a spearman. And we came through Perryton to see my folks. And we hung it up. And my dad is <laughs> doing this crazy thing. And then I was like, oh, my goodness. My son is crazy. And my dad is crazy. And that means a sandwich right in the middle, whether I realize it or not, I too am kind of crazy. Amen. <laughs> crazy. And, and what's cool about this, my dad's over 65 or something like that. I don't know, somewhere around in there. And he has not stopped having fun. He's what we have deemed the czar of fun. In fact, whenever he dies, I'm going to take on his title as the czar of fun. That is going to be my thing. I will now be the czar of fun. And so actually I'm, I'm claiming that title after he dies. I'm going to take it before he dies. Um, <laughs> but it's mine. I've got it. I've got my eye on it. One day, my son Eli, me, we were sitting at my folks' house, and my son Eli drew this picture in, on, on dad's iPad. He's like, hey, d hey, grandpa, can you build us a tree house? Can you build me a tree house? And me and my dad started to talk to him about, look, you need to manage your expectations. It's not time. You know, like we'd have to go get this, you know, blah, blah, blah. We'd have to go get the materials. We'd have to go figure out what tree we could build it. And we'd have to get grandma's uh, permission to build a tree house. We would have to, uh, you know, we'd, we'd have to have time that we could build it. We'd have to, 
and, we, and so, so there we were building a tree house. Go ahead and uh, throw that one up there. Um, um, we built this amazing tree house. This is one side of it. Um, and there's the other. We've got built a freaking rope bridge, and, and, and it's got a cargo net, and, and then uh, that one's my tree house. That, that began to inspire the next tree house, which is uh, my, my tree house. But go back to the other one. Uh, this one has a double deck, boom, boom. You got one ladder that goes up, and you go onto the deck, and you got a hatch that you come through up onto the top deck. You can do a rock wall over here. There is a, a fireman's pole off the other side. There's a rope ladder up this side. There's a pulley. You can kind of see those two yellow lines there. That's where, where my dad will like get on the side by side, and he'll back up real fast, and he'll like, shoot up in the air and, and hopefully not jam his hand into that pulley. Um, and, then, and then he'll let him drop real fast and then catch him right before he falls. Someone say fun. fun. <laughs> and, uh, and that rope bridge is the coolest rope bridge you have ever seen in your entire life. And that is like way freaking up in the sky. Okay. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. So, but, but, but what's crazy is that didn't happen in a day. But we, the, the day Eli asked us, we thought, you know, how funny would it be if we just did it? If we took this, this little drawing he did and we freaking did it, we just said yes. Someone say, just say yes. Say yes. And uh, we could have said tomorrow or tomorrow or whatever, but no, we just said yes. And that day we were building a tree house, <laughs> which inspired the next one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this was the tree house in my backyard, complete with two decks, uh, a, a ladder that goes into the hatch up in the middle right there. There's a foldable table there for date nights with me and Carrie. We've got this, this square rope ladder, a balance beam. There's more I've built on it since then. There's, a, um, there, there's, there's monkey bars here. There's a big crazy rope swing thing on the other side. This is me and the Zara Fun himself, Terry Littaw. Uh, we got monkey, monkey bars, vine ropes, that, and we play, laser, or we play lava tag on it, and, and it's, an ongo- it's got an ongoing ever-building an American Ninja Warrior course on the bottom side underneath it. And during the pandemic, um, my dad got laid off. It only lasted a, a week, and, and I called him. I said, hey, Dad, do you want to build a treehouse, another treehouse? He was there that night. And in that morning, I went off to, the, to Lowe's, what my, my, my kids affectionately call hell, and uh, we went to Lowe's, D- the Home Depot type store, got all the wood, had it there. The next day, we started building this thing. We started throwing boards up into the, go ahead, yeah, there's Eli coming up through the hatch right there. And uh, I don't know if we have one more. Do we have one more, or is that it? That's probably it. Okay. We, we cut around the trees. Do you see that? Anyway, it's pretty awesome. Pretty good stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. And my dad, what's so crazy about him is he just said yes. He just said yes. I could ask my dad anything. He would just say yes. That's what's so crazy about my dad. And I, I, I hope to be half the man my dad is because he just said yes. I could ask him for anything. He would just do it. It's amazing. So years before the first two um, um, uh, tree houses, my dad called me up one day and said, hey, Mikey. He said, uh, I want to build the biggest zip line in the Texas panhandle. And he freaking did it. He built the biggest zip line in the Texas Panhandle until Paladro Canyon decided to build one that was a little bit bigger. But go ahead and take it to that picture. This thing has oil, is made of oil-filled pipe. Now, you see the pipe up on this side, and then there's one way down there, 500 feet down the hill. This is made of an oil-filled uh, 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 staircase, and he, he welded all this up. Go to the next one. And this is what it looks like up on the platform. And so you hook on to your, your, your straps and you get your little carabiner up there and then you zoom down there. And the way you get back up there, and, oh, by the way, the way you stop is he's got tires that are, that are on the, the zip line. So your, your carriage hits the first one and the tire and it slows down and hits the second one and it slows down and hits the se- third one. And just, it's a really good braking system. It looks really redneck, but it's amazing. <laughs> and it looks rusty, but it's powerful and it's strong. And, uh, and, and the way you get back up is um, you throw down a rope to the guy on the side beside, and he just freaking zips you back up and gets you right up, and, and it slows down right at the end so you don't slam into that pole at the end. <laughs> and it's so much freaking fun. Someone say fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was so crazy. Um, is it safe? No. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's safe enough. It's, it's oil-filled safe. It's, it is what I say, safety forth. We'll get there in a moment. Is it safe? Yeah, it's safe enough, I guess. You know, do, do you need to be you know, bubble wrapped and, and, and like foam padded? I mean, I mean, did you get raised by, by helicopter parents? Or, or are you ready to have some fun? Do you want to have fun? 
then you've got to get rid of safe. Because if it's safe, it's not fun. Okay. Someone say, where is he going right now? Why is he talking about tree houses and zip lines? <laughs> Why is safety the first thing you think of? Oh, someone say, we're going somewhere. <laughs> is it fun? Yes, it's fun. It's so much fun. Uh, yesterday on my time hop, um, it reminded me of the great snow of 2019. You guys remember this? And Fusion, the Bible study was going on, and it was snowing like crazy. And I, I got Hadley, and I got AJ, and a few other people, and I got them in trouble because I said, don't go to Fusion, come with me. We're getting wheelbarrow. And we, we shoveled snow, and we created this crazy slide out the back door of my Cooper's apartment that went down the staircase in a little half pipe. And it came up, and, it, and then it comes to the bottom, and you slide around, and, um, and nobody got hurt. I mean, uh, Tracy did hop the barrier and slide across, <laughs> slide across. Actually, we got a video of that. You want to show that video real quick? Yes, this is... And, and we caught her, yeah. And the time before that, though, she actually left the thing and slid right into that car. However, in the sandbox that God had made, the friction from the road slowed her down just enough so when she hit the car, she didn't die. It was great. Was it worth it? Yes. It was so much fun. And let me just tell you, this is when I developed it. And Hadley never was like, whoa, 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 is this safe? Is this safe? And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. safety fourth. Safety fourth, right? Because relationships, relationships are number one. Freedom is number two. You need to write this down. Freedom is number two. <laughs> Fun is number three. Listen, if, you ain't, you got, if you're going to walk with the Spirit, you've got to keep in step with the Spirit. All right? Relationships, freedom, Fun and then and then safety and the only reason I put safety in there is because if you don't have just a little bit of safety, if someone gets hurt, it's no longer fun, and that's why fun is so freaking important. Amen. Why is it that when people grow up, they get old and they get not fun anymore? They're not awesome anymore. They took risks before and they stopped. They got hurt one too many times. They decided not to have fun anymore, and now fun looks like just sitting back on a porch somewhere. I'm like, what happened to fun? What happened to awesome? When I was a kid, I determined not to lose that sense of wonder. Guys, the community that came out of that, that snow slide and everybody going back and forth, the alumni still speak about it today, the fun, the memories that were made because we just said yes. So I, we, it's like, man, eh, it's cold. Oh, it's hard work. Oh, we got to shovel this stuff. And I was like, you know what? Let's just say yes. Someone say, just say yes. Listen, when, when did adults forget how to have fun and be awesome? I'm like, if it's not fun, don't do it. You know what I mean? Like, like if, I, if I go for too long of a period without having fun, I just want to stab my eyes out. Amen? Is anybody else, you know what I'm talking about? Like the only thing, reason you go through hard thing is so that you can have fun at the end. You know what I'm talking about? When people say grow up, they, they, they mean stop dreaming and stop having fun and stop being awesome. Grow up, stop being awesome. Stop dreaming. Stop having fun. In all three of these cases, with the, the first tree house, the second tree house, and with the zip line, and with, I guess all four cases, and with the snow slide, we all just started with a yes. We had no idea how it was going to turn out. We just started throwing some boards up in a tree and start figuring the dang thing out and figuring out how to make it strong enough to hold everybody up. Yes starts with belief. No starts with predictable. No says it's not safe, it's, and no is predictable. Yes sounds a lot like, why not? When's the last time you said, why not? I had to train myself to start saying, why not? Someone brings me this crazy harebrained idea, and I'm like, okay. I, I, I want to say it's never going to work, but I say, you know what, why not? Let's, let's, let's entertain the idea. Let's, let's land the 747 on the stage. Let's see what happens. Can we land a 747 on the stage? And instead of saying, no, we can't do that. That's ridiculous. This is a building. You can't land a plane flat like that. Are you kidding me? You would destroy the building. You blah, blah, blah. Instead, I know it sounds so crazy just to say, why not? Let's land a 747 on the stage. What do I mean by that? I mean, why don't we start with possibility and work our way to a no? What I've learned, and I learned this from a creative conference way back in like 2009, 
uh, at church media conference, and they were talking about landing the 747 on the stage. And what that means is, yeah, okay, we are obviously in the back of our mind, we know we can't actually land a 747 on the stage. But what if we said, okay, what are we trying to accomplish by landing a 747 on the stage? What are we trying to get to? Is it like the awe of the, like the crazy shake? Or, or is it like, what are we trying to accomplish? And is there another way that we can get to it? And what's crazy is when you start with a yes, you start to get to places you would have never gotten if you just shut it down with a no. Yes is bold. Someone say, yes is bold. Yes starts with possibilities rather than starting with the problem. How many times did God ask you to do something, and the first thing you do is you start thinking of all the reasons it won't work. Well, we don't have enough money. Well, it would never, I don't have time. Well, I just don't think I could do it. What if you just started with a yes, and you think about, okay, what would happen if we did? And I know we can't, but what if we did? starts with, boldness starts, and yes, starts with possibilities, not the problems. Yes starts, it does not ignore the cost. It realizes the cost is there, but it leaps over the cost to see what the return is going to be. Amen? Starting with yes doesn't guarantee success. Listen, we have no control over how the thing ends. All we have control over is our attitude and how we start and when we start. Our attitude of how we start, we, have, we can control the starting line. We cannot control how, what things come against us in life. And that's why, because we can't see the end, most people never start. And if we wait to start until we're sure we know everything that's going to happen between here and there, what God's calling me to do in my life, what he wants me to do with my life, with my vocation, with my family, and who I'm with, and all the things, and my friend group, if I got to figure out what all is going to happen, and I got to see every step in between, we will never start. So someone say, start with yes. yes. Timothy, uh, Paul comes to Timothy. Timothy had other things. He was doing other things. He's probably working a full-time job. He was probably had a family business going. He was going along doing his thing. He, you know, he's an upstart. He's a 20-year-old just getting along with life. And all of a sudden, God gets in the way of his day with a guy named Paul. Paul throws up everything. He says, hey, here's this one-time opportunity. Come with me. And, P, and, and Timothy has this, this choice to make at that moment. Play it safe. I don't understand what this guy wants me to do or what I'm going to do with my life. And I have my plans and I don't know if I can do that. And, blah, blah, blah. and he starts, he could have started with no, but instead he's like, yes, we'll do that. And Timothy becomes one of the guys that we have two books of the Bible written to from Paul. He becomes the pastor of Ephesus. Him and Paul and Silas go and start a church, the whole, all the churches over in the West. This becomes the bridge between the East and the West, which is Macedonia. And that is the, the beginning of, of, of uh, Europe and then now us. And if they hadn't said yes, the gospel wouldn't have come over there. They started with a yes, even if it was terrifying. Everyone wants an awesome and adventurous life. But most people don't start with yes, they kill it with a no, they kill it with I can't, they kill it with that's not practical before they even get started. Most people live an average life, not an awesome life. Back in 2013, and, and I'm telling you, even in the church we think like this, we have the, the creator of God himself, creator God himself that, that is inside of us that can guide us into all truth and guide us into these cool things. But we shut them down and we say it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. Back in 2013, some of you guys, who was here back in 2013? Yeah, you guys remember, some of you guys remember, we, d we did this film series, it was called an action-packed sci-fi sermon series. Someone say that five times fast. Action-packed sci-fi sermon series. And uh, the way that this thing, it was a, it was, the way this thing started is I was in this committee for One Way Youth Camp out at Cedar Canyon. And I'm one of the directors on the team, and, and we're talking about what way we should go. And I just had this idea, you know, because we were thinking about how the flesh nature, how, it, how it's kind of like, um, it turns you into a zombie, right? Um, I was, you know, I was thinking about what, you know, like what pornography does to people and how for hours they just look like zombies, just clicking and clicking and clicking and drooling and just clicking. And they just look like zombies, right? Whole hours can go by. Just, you know, and it like turns you into somebody that you don't want to be. It turns you into a zombie, right? The flesh does that. And it doesn't just do it in lust, but in other ways too. And I was like, okay, so we got four nights. What if we did a zombie film, a four-part zombie film? And they're like, what does zombies have to do with Jesus? What about the parents? What about the blood? What about the violence? What about the gore? I don't know about all that, Mike. They started with a no. But a friend of mine, actually Cam's dad and uh, Connor's dad, um, Scott, was like, he does this. Hmm. 
why don't you bring something back next time and, and we'll see if it's good. So I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So me and my apprentices, we get together, we make this script and we start, we start filming this, this crazy film called Biophage. And, and it, it's so crazy. Um, um, it was, it was, it was like the virus is the, you know, the flesh, right? And, and Cooper gets his arm bit. And so we got to decide what to do with him. So we got cut off his arm, you know, that right hand that offends you, right? You better, or pluck out your eye, you know? So we cut off his arm to save his life. And, and the next film, he gets a robot arm. It's crazy. It's really cool. It's on our YouTube pay, cha- channel. And it, it was amazing. It was so much fun. And, um, and, and, and we did a four part series and the kids came alive at camp. They really got into it. It was so crazy. You remember that, Kristen? You were there, right? Yeah, you were like, what? You know, everybody was like, what? And, and what's so crazy is I got to preach that camp, and we had, we had so many kids get saved at the altars, and one of those kids was named uh, Tanner Bowman. You may have heard of him. That was the year Tanner Bowman gave his heart to the Lord, and Tanner Bowman has gone on to become one of our academy interns, and then now he's working at Faith Southwest leading worship, and, and, and what's crazy is that that film, we just said yes, it was a lot of work, it was hard work, but it spoke the gospel message in a way that like a lot of people would come up to me afterward and say, man, that spoke to me in a way I never thought, like I, it made the gospel make sense to me, and, and on night four, we did a call to ministry, and over 100 kids came up on stage. One of those kids was Zach Money, who I talked about in the last of the, the uh, Philippians sermon series, where uh, he went back home and, and was witnessing to his friends when he, was, when he, got, when he got killed. And another one of those kids that, that gave his heart to the Lord in, in that same place and, and then also um, gave his heart to the ministry or, 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 or re- released and just said yes to God in ministry. And we laid our hands on each one of them. His name was Hayden Hensley. Hayden Hensley would grow up to become one of my apprentices also, like Tanner Bowman. And he would then become the youth pastor here who is now a youth pastor of my daughter. Just say yes. Just say yes. Amen. It was so freaking awesome, and, and with the equipment we had, we built this thing that was not to Hollywood standard, but was still pretty awesome, and we, we tried it out first on the, on, on the Wesley, and in the Wesley, uh, in between sermons, we would do these things called subnet transmissions, where I'd drop a, a latitude and longitude little video kind of thing, and people would go out there with like Nerf guns, and we'd fight zombies, so it was like humans versus zombies. We had people like up on the top floor of Old Ed that were like trapped, and zombies roaming around through Old Ed, and like a whole team of people tactically trained, because Ben Wentz, who is now a Green Beret, one of my other apprentices, um, was training them how to use tactical um, um, uh, Nerf guns. And so we went down to Old Ed, <laughs> went up the stairs like pop, pop, pop. We were guarding each other's angles and everything like that. We took these three people that were up on the top floor and each week we'd have to fight the zombies and it had something to do with Jesus. Now, why do all that? Because it was awesome. Someone say it was awesome. It was awesome. We are so dang practical we forgot to live awesome. You know what I'm saying? Listen, awesome is a little bit dangerous. There may be dragons out there in those woods Spoiler alert, there are. There are dragons out in those woods. Some, sometimes you're not going to completely be sure about even your next step, but you just got to start taking those steps. Good old Limity Snicket. You remember that guy? He, <laughs> he said, if we wait until we are ready, we will be waiting the rest of our lives. This, this led to um, a second film that we did, and it was just, it was amazing. And one day it was like, it was snowing. And I just called up the guys. I was like, guys, grab the camera, grab the sound gear, grab the stuff, and grab the actors, and let's, let's, let's go. We're going out to the, the pig farm, and we're going to film the scene, and blah, 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 in the snow. And, and back then, people were a little bit more flexible, and, and they just grabbed the cameras, and they just went. They didn't have to have a schedule and everything like that. I went through a filming schedule. I was like, let's just grab the cameras, and let's just start freaking shooting. And what I found was that the most awesome scenes in the movies and in our movies had the craziest weather. We drove down to the white sands and we filmed out in the desert and it was overheating and we had to hide the camera from the sun and then film a little bit and then hide the camera and then film a little bit. But that was one of the coolest scenes because it was in the desert, right? You don't get the desert without heat. If you watch Dune, anybody watch Dune? I guarantee you those people were hot filming that movie because the coolest scenes have the most intense weather that we watch in, well, we're eating our popcorn and, you know, in our, in our air conditioned building. You don't realize that the coolest things happen, and they got to be a part of filming it because they went through that weather. They didn't have to have a schedule. Guys, if we were a little bit more flexible when the Holy Spirit moved, 
he could use us more. You know who I, you know who gets to, you know who gets to be, get used the most around here? The people who say yes. If you say yes, I'm like, come on, let's go. Boom. Guess who's going to learn the most? Will. Will shows up every day at the, at the coffee shop and, and Cole and boom, we're just right there. And I don't mean to, but we just start talking all of a sudden they start getting all this. And we we're talking about how they've learned more just from like sitting around, just, 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 just hanging out with an older, old guy. Then, then, then these planned moments that we have planned out where God's going to move. We're going to plan for God to move here and here and here. You can't plan for that. You just got to grab your freaking camera and go. Someone say yes. yes. Just grab your camera and go. Don't try to look for perfection. Don't try to have every little thing mapped out because God's going to be like, okay, fine. I need somebody more flexible. You? Okay, let's go. And we'll go. Activate your faith. Author Albert Hubbard said, the greatest mistake you can make in life is continually fearing that you will make one. The worst mistake you can make is being so tied up in your fear that you're going to make a mistake. That's what holds you back. Marshall uh, Silver said, you can never get more by saying no. You can, you can hold your current position by saying no, but you can only move forward by saying yes. Man, this is a great one. American technology businessman and software engineer Eric Smith said this, find a way to say yes to things. Just say yes. Say yes to to invitations to a new country. Say yes to meeting new friends. Say yes to learning a new language, picking up a new sport. Say yes is how you get your first job and your next job and your spouse and even your kids. (laughs) If even if it's a bit edgy, a bit out of your comfort zone, saying yes means that you will do something new, meet someone new and make a difference in your life. Yes lets you stand out of the crowd. Be the optimist to say to stay positive. Be the one that everyone comes to because you said yes, right? Yes is is what will keep you young. Do you see my dad? (laughs) Yes will keep you young. Next time you have a crazy God idea, I want you to to write this down. Next time you have a crazy God idea or just this kind of idea that comes through and you're not sure if it's God or not, start with a yes until you have to say no. Start with yes until you have to say no. Land the 747 on the stage until you can't. And pull that idea out as long as you can and see if you can get something else out of that idea. That idea might not work, but the next one might. And a rough draft is never a final copy. Amen. I have people hand me this thing, and I'm like, what the heck is this? This is a rough draft. Go do it again. Like, oh, no, this is, my, this is my work. And I'm like, no, it's a rough draft. It's not a final copy. A rough draft is never a final copy. Amen? I'm getting too practical on you guys. you got to work your craft, my friends. you got to work your craft. Amen? Average or awesome? That's, you, that's your choice tonight. Average or awesome? Average is predictable. Awesome is adventurous. When faced with the decision to be awesome or stay average, most of us stay familiar with the familiar and the comfortable. In fact, 99% of the people on the planet do average. The road is well worn. Decisions are obvious. Next steps are clear. We love the idea of living an awesome life, but then we try to live that awesome life by making the road very average and predictable, and then we end up back to average again. You don't get to awesome on the road to average. Amen? And the only way, the play, the only way that a, the average load, road leads is to average. We want to plan the road to awesome start to finish, to have every detail laid out before we take a single step. And if, if we take the first step on the road to awesome, it gets easier with each step. Adopt this phrase. Let's see where it goes. I don't know. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Adopt that phrase. We're so afraid of work (laughs) that we don't want to try something if we don't think it's going to work. But that's where we miss out on the beauty of life. I don't know. Let's see where it goes. Man, I think of people like Ryan Quist. Ryan Quist wanted to learn more about the prayer, about how to pray. Yeah. He wanted to learn how to pray. He didn't, he's like, I kind of know how to pray, but I kind of want to learn how to pray. So, he, so, of course, he joins the prayer team. And then the, the prayer team leader graduates, and because he's faithful, because he's always there, because he says yes, and because he's faithful, available, and teachable, and, and the, the other guy left a few months later, gave him everything he got. And Ryan Quist learned a lot about prayer because he became the prayer team leader before he felt like he was ready. If you feel like you have to be ready before you start, you will never start. I think about people like Kayla Moody who had only been, (laughs) she'd only been saved a few months before, and before she knew it, she was the, the, she was the fusion leader of Cross Hall Fusion, 
right? And some people are like, I know that. They're, they're just, they, they don't, they put people in too early, blah, 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 blah. You know what the best discipleship is? Learning how to freaking swim. That's what the best discipleship is. And she wasn't alone. She had a coach over watching her. But some of us, we get so tied up in how much we know that we forget that the faith is only partially what we know and a whole lot more what we walk out. A whole lot more of the time we spend with the people outside of our fusion group, okay? I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. A lot more about what happens outside of class than just what happens. Who cares what you know until they know how much you care? Amen? So those of you signing up to be fusion leaders, remember that. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But Kayla Moody didn't feel ready, but she just said yes. And look at her freaking now. Man, this girl became the, the person who had like, like memories. They, they call them memories, like cr- crazy K- Kayla memories. She would just take them out and do all kinds of crazy things. I think one happened last Saturday night. They were doing all kinds of, with, yeah, right? And, the, and everybody's going nuts in the building and stuff like that. I think about people like Esther. Esther didn't know anything about cameras and cables and wires and SDI cables and BNC connectors and soundboards and switchers. She just said yes, because she was like, where do you need help? And we're like, man, we need help in the media booth. And so she was like, okay, tell me what to do. And we told her what to do. We showed her what the BNC connectors were, the AES over EUD, uh, EUB uh, connectors were to the audio ultralight. Uh, it was fine. And she figured it out, right? And then she began to lead the team. Why? Because not because she was so good at doing the little thing. The little technical thing is because she was a good leader because she loved people. All right. Um, anyway, Amen. she didn't feel ready, but she just said, yes, man. I think about people like Nick Clifton. <laughs> I went on his Facebook. I couldn't find a single picture of him except for that one. And so um, anyway, <laughs> same thing with Will. I only saw one picture of Will and he was like two years old. I don't know what the heck that's about anyway. <laughs> like a little kid, Will. I don't know what's up with that. Yeah, Nick Clifton was a brand new believer. He's kind of this atheist that fought God and fought the, the fusion leaders. The fusion leaders stayed on top of him. And then he kind of started, he gave his heart to the Lord. And, and so uh, he's like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll join the leadership team, but I'm not filling out the thing. And so we had to basically twist his arm to join the lead team. And so Sarah Mercer had to type it out while he dictated what it was that he wanted to answer in his... <laughs> And it's, he wasn't ready, but he just freaking started, and now he's in the, in the academy, and he's, getting, he's doing ministry, and he's doing all kinds of things. God's moving in his life. I think of people like Skylar. Um, here's the crazy thing about Skylar, man. She said yes to this crazy idea. Like, God's like, how about, how about we don't just do it on Tuesday night? How about we do it the rest of your life, too? And she started up these things called Motivational Mondays, where she would just begin to pour out. And I was like, who does that? Start up the blogs and all these things. And I'm like, yes, yes. You don't need to be a pastor and a professional before you can start witnessing to people. And, and she just freaking said yes. And she's like, you know what? I'm at the radio station. I'm going to start inviting people. People are like, I don't, I don't like organized religion. I, I prefer disorganized religion. Religion. I guess people. I guess people prefer disorganized religion. I don't know what they like, but anyway, they were like, "I don't want to." But she just kept being kind and nice and sweet, and she gives them a, her life is like a window into what it looks like to be a Christian, i.e., what it means to be a Wesley person. So that's the same thing, right? People are like, I, I, "I like you, but I, I don't like the Wesley." It's like, "Well, I am the Wesley." Well, I like, I like you, Carson, but I don't really like the Wesley. It's like, well, I'm one of them, so we're the same. We are the Wesley. So if you like me, if you, don't, if you like me, then you like them. If you don't like me, you don't like them. I mean, that's just how it is because we're one. Amen? Amen. Don't let them separate you from the body. Anyway, so she's like, man, I'm showing them what, what it's like to be, you know, knowing that once people meet us, it will change their preconceived ideas of what we are. She's a window into the world of what God is all about. I think about... Um, people like Adrian, man, this is crazy. <laughs> Look at that man. Look at that handsome man. Adrian said yes to Jesus on even what he wears. What do you mean by that? Check this out. What, how he wears his clothes. Check this out. On, on days that he teaches SI sessions, he was like, you know what would be awesome? 
Like if I didn't wear my Wesley shirt on other days and, and on my SI session day when I'm teaching SI where I could be the biggest impact, impact to people, I'll wear my Wesley shirt and people will ask me about it. And I'll be able to tell them about the Wesley. And then he said, you know what? The, the professor said I could have my class anywhere. Could I have it at the Wesley? And, and they said, yeah, you can have it wherever you want to. He's like, dude, I'm totally having it in the Wesley. And as he's walking in, people are in the lobby and like, hey, what's going on? Like, oh, this place ain't so weird after all. And they go to the library and he teaches them and they ask questions and they're like, oh, this is a pretty normal place strategic. He even said yes to how he wears his clothes. Think about that. That's crazy. I think about people like, like Victory. Man. Yeah. Victory, when she came, Victory, where are you at? Where are you at, Victory? So shy. She's somewhere. Oh, she's online. Oh, she's online tonight. Okay. Victory, wherever you're at, wherever the cameras are, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> she was super, super shy. I mean, like, could bar- hardly even, like, like, look you in the eye when she first got here. But then God's like, hey, I want you to lead the international team. And she said, okay, yes, <laughs> I'll do that, I'll do that. And this year in September, we threw an international party in Legacy Hall. This girl was going table to table to table. I am victory. Let me tell you about the West. Let me tell you about this thing we got called Mosaic. Let me tell you about Jesus to Muslim kids and all kinds of other kids, kids that were too cool and kids that were not, you know, and and everybody. She was talking to everybody. She was dancing on the dance floor. Man, she just said yes. Someone say, just say yes. I think about McKenna, right? This girl yes. up and changed her major a few weeks ago to follow, to follow Jesus' calling into worship ministry. She just said yes, just like Megan Bash, who recently also changed her major. Same thing. She came to WT set on, on helping animals, and then God turned her eyes to humans. And she tried to put the two together, and, and she finally said, fine, Jesus, I'll give you my life. She changed her major, and she's going all in into ministry and it's a beautiful thing. There's nothing wrong with animals, nothing wrong at all, nothing wrong at all. But for her, God, God called her to do something else and she was willing to change everything just like Timothy was willing to change everything, even his major, to go into a place he didn't know, to do th- something unconventional that he didn't have the steps laid out for him that he was just gonna have to go and trust God. That's boldness. Yes is bold, amen? amen. Yes is bold. Listen, Once you say yes the first time, it gets easier and easier. Next time you have a crazy God idea, start with yes. And if you have to, work your way to a no. But start with yes and keep working it until you have to say no. Instead of starting with no and God says, okay, fine, how about you? Oh, no, how about you? Okay, no, you? Oh, you? Then let's freaking go. Let's go. And you guys get to sit by it and watch as you go and live awesome. And then you guys hate the person who goes and does awesome because it makes you feel not awesome. So if you don't want to feel average and not awesome, just freaking go. Amen? Someone say go. Jesus already told you. You don't have to pray about it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He's already told you to do it. Amen? Amen. So, so Paul and takes Silas with him. They get to this place called Lystra and Derby. Paul knows it's a risk to take this kid with him, but he says yes. This young man doesn't know Paul very well, but he leaves everything he knows, and he says yes, and he changes his major. He takes up this call as a pastor, and he becomes a pastor of Ephesus, and it's one of the the churches that changes the world as we know it to this day. The gospel at this point had not made it into uh, Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece, and so why do we say no? Why do we say we can't and you got the wrong guy and I could never? Why don't we start with the S? I think it's three reasons. We think it's impossible or our mind is too small to see what a big God can do. Two, we don't know how to give up control. We don't know how to give up control. And uh, I think I had a quote in there about, um, I just kind of had this idea last night um, about you can either have awesome or you can have control, but you can't have both. You can either have awesome and not have control, not be in control of what God's doing, or you can be in control and live average, but you can't have control and be awesome. Amen? Amen. We don't give up control because we're afraid. We're afraid of failure, looking dumb, rejection, if it doesn't work. Maybe deep down we're even worried that God doesn't exist, so we don't want to even lay ourselves out there because we don't want to put out hope. Worship team, you can come. At our worship night, not many weeks ago, you guys remember the worship night a couple weeks ago? Yeah. 
Um, uh, I rem- do you guys remember I-, I-, I called out Will and I was like, Will! And he was out in the hallway. I was like, all right, fine, whatever. Um, but then he came back in because he was, well, he was praying for somebody out there. He wasn't just, you know, messing around, going to the bathroom or whatever. He- and-, and he came in and I was like, bro, you've got a calling as an evangelist. And he- you remember that? And he- you guys remember that? Yeah. Like the anointing, the mantle was upon you, right? And he felt called to say something. He got up and said some things and all kinds of stuff. And uh, at the end of the service, we were standing right back there. And I, I just felt God say, hey, do three things, Will. And I'm saying this to you now. Write this down. As we start this series, we're going we're gonna to see God do some crazy things, okay? This is just the beginning. One, I said, Will, what you need to do is you need to pray for opportunities. Pray for opportunities. Pray that God would give you an opportunity to reach out to the people in Legends. Uh, pray that God would uh, give you an opportunity to reach out to the person just on the street and, and the person in your classroom and the person wherever, just wherever you are. Pray that God would open up doors for you. So do that. Pray for opportunities. The second thing you need to do is scan or look for opportunities. Look for opportunities. Because when you're praying for them, all of a sudden now you're looking for them, right? And, and now it makes sense to look for them. And now he's looking for opportunities. And I said, the third thing you need to do is step into the opportunity. Step into yes. Someone say step into yes. Step into yes. Why don't we? We're going to talk about this all in the next few weeks and what we can do to do these things. And so Saturday night rolls. That was Tuesday night. Saturday night rolls around. Fifth quarter's bumping. And it's sweaty. And it's that nasty crack smell. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like mosh pit nasty down there. You know what I'm saying? The walls are sweating. It's, ha- it's nasty. And he's hot. And he comes upstairs to get a breath of air. And there on the benches is a man who looks a little bit sad. Now, Will has been praying for opportunities. And he sees an opportunity. Will could have just been like, oh going back downstairs now. Sorry, you're sad, dude. But instead, he stepped into the opportunity. This guy's smoking, and he's just sitting there. It just seems like his world's fall apart, and, and uh, I don't want to talk about all of it because I don't want to, uh, you know, like give away anything or whatever, but he's having a really hard time. Never been a believer before. Will sits there, starts telling him the gospel. I'm back home. I'm getting ready to preach a sermon the next day at a church, and I get this phone call. Will's like, hey, can you come up here and lead this guy to Jesus? I said, no, 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 Will. You lead them to Jesus. You know what to do. You guys remember this story? So dude freaking leads them to Jesus. He stepped into his opportunity. The same thing can happen to all of us, guys. We, we pray for the opportunity. We look for it. And when we see it, we don't freak out and freeze. We step into the opportunity. Amen? What happens if you don't? Nothing. Nothing at all. What happens if you don't step into your calling? Nothing. Nothing happens. God's called you to do something awesome. Amen? Underneath your chairs is 20 ways you can start with yes. I gave you those three things too. Pray for opportunities, look for opportunities, step into opportunities. Say yes until you have to say no. Now, you might not do all of these, but some of you are like, I want to say yes, Mikey. Awesome. What do I need to do now? And I'm like, well, maybe one of these. Tonight, okay, some of you guys have never been baptized before. It's time to get freaking baptized, AJ. Amen. Who needs to be baptized? Stand up if you need to be baptized. All right. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Sweet. How about this? Kayla, could you give me a sign-up list? If you want to get baptized, that might be your next step. Here in just a second, I want you to go back to to Kayla, and and she's going to have a sign-up list. We're going to put your name down, and we'll get a meeting together, talk about what baptism is, and then we're going to freaking baptize you. That might be what some of you guys need. Also, right after this, like literally right, right when we're done praying, in that room across the hallway, uh, I'm going to be talking about what it means to be on the lead team. Some of you guys, maybe your yes is just to step onto the leadership team. Say, Mikey, wherever you need me. Uh, maybe on a, on a team somewhere or in Fusion. Man, I got a heart for my dorm. Boom. Join us, man. Join us. Let's do this thing. Amen? So some of you guys want to know what that's about. If you want to know what it's about to join the lead team, we're about to open it up. I'm going to describe that in that room across the hallway right after this. Maybe your social media 
needs to become a window into the life of a believer. It doesn't, it's not all scriptures. Sometimes they need to see that you have fun. They need to see that you're an actual human, that you love things, that you're, you, you have a life, and you also love Jesus. Let your, stop saying, I don't ever post anything on social media. Forget that. That's like never going out in public. Open up your social media to be an open window to what it looks like to be a Christian. Open your life up to people. Say, yeah, I love God. I also love the movie Dune. That was awesome. I love my wife, my kids. Check out this cool treehouse. Here's my life. 